Okay. Um, well, I think you heard from us about um, some of the benefits of using natural gas, both economic benefits and uh, climate benefits. Um, and now we'd like to probe some of these issues in a little more detail. Um, I'm going to very briefly introduce the panel. The bios are in your packets. Um, and it's a great panel. Uh, it's even a diverse panel. Uh, she said. <laughs> so um, <laughs> uh, on my immediate left is Tom Farrell. He's the chairman, CEO, and president of Dominion Resources. Um, on my far left is Daryl Banks, who heads energy <coughs> policy at the Center for American Progress. And in the middle, because I guess you like to be in the middle, oh, the <laughs> is <laughs> Dave McCurdy, uh, who's the head of the American Gas Association. So I'm going to ask each of them to talk for maybe five minutes and give you some perspective. And then I'm going to ask uh, a couple of questions. And then we're going to open it up uh, for you to ask uh, harder questions. Uh, so let me start with uh, Tom. Thank you, Eileen. Good morning, everyone. I'm going <clears> to <throat> give you a few uh, minutes on what Dominion, our company, so you'll understand the perspective we come from, and then give you a few thoughts. Uh, first, I think it's a very e excellent report. Uh, makes a lot of progress in an area that needs a lot of progress. First, a little bit about Dominion, just so you'll understand our perspective. We just we have about 28,000 megawatts of uh, electric generation portfolio. It's coal, nuclear, gas, oil, hydro, uh, wind, some solar coming, uh, and a growing uh, biomass. Uh, but importantly for this discussion, I think we also have interests, a very large interest, uh, about 11,000 miles of piping, both in gathering, uh, distribution infrastructure, high, high uh, pressure interstate pipelines, uh, mm -hmm. largest gas storage facilities in North America. All this is uh, located in the Appalachian Basin. We also own an LNG import facility, which is about 50 miles from here uh, on the Chesapeake Bay. It's called Cove Point. Uh, and it's one which we are uh, seeking an export permit, uh, which gives us a, a certain perspective about that, I think. Uh, natural gas is making a very large difference. Uh, obviously, this report uh, does that. Just to give you some uh, perspective, electric production from our natural gas units at Dominion uh, went to about 14 million megawatt hours. I don't know how many uh, uh, matches that is. I'll have to have to work on how many matches. Uh, I'm going to have to work on the matches there uh, part. But I like that. So that's a million, trillion, quadrillion matches, something like that. Um, and gas uh, accounted for about 25 percent of our production last year. Uh, by 2017, because of what we're building at the, at the present time, we expect that to increase to 40 percent uh, of our production in just four years, from about 20, 25 to over 40. It's becoming the new normal in power production. And uh, Eileen touched on the lower, much lower levels of greenhouse gas emissions uh, that have resulted from that. One of the issues that uh, CTUS is, ES is looking at is the, uh, what happens to the gas from the wellhead through the power production and how much of it is, uh, escapes. And there has been an issue around, uh, estimates have been used for a long time. Uh, some real data has shown up on that, which uh, shows that natural gas, the loss is uh, down less than 1.5%, uh, which is obviously quite good. That doesn't mean you can't make it better. Uh, you can make it better. Uh, and there are not only environmental reasons to make it better, there are uh, business reasons to make it better. Uh, that's a product uh, that we don't want lost into the atmosphere. We want to capture it. Uh, and, and deliver it uh, for, to our customers, uh, whether that's through our pipeline system uh, at the wellhead where it's gathered uh, and brought into our pipeline system when it's put into gas storage, when it's released from the gas storage, when it goes to our LNG mm -hmm. export facility. So there's, econo there's economic reasons uh, as well as environmental uh, <coughs> reasons for doing it. One of the things I just want to touch on briefly is, uh, and it was very briefly touched on uh, in, the, in the summary, was the importance, that it, this report touches on the importance of fuel diversity, maintaining fuel diversity in the generation fleet. Gas is a wonderful resource. It's particularly wonderful for Domin our company because we're not only burning it uh, in our power plants uh, to deliver it to our customers, but we're also gathering it and uh, transporting it and then delivering it to end use customers through a whole different part of our company. But at the same time, it's extremely important 
uh, for our future that we not put all our eggs in this basket uh, going forward. Natural gas is an important answer. It doesn't solve the climate, it doesn't solve carbon emissions. It's still 50 percent uh, uh, level of coal, as you heard. I've seen studies that said if we shut down every coal plant in the United States today and replaced it with natural gas and you take into account uh, uh, economic growth, population growth, by the time you get to 2050, you're going to have just as many, uh, just as high carbon emissions levels uh, from gas in 2050 as you have today. And we're supposed to be 80 percent below the 1990 levels uh, by 2050, according to the Kyoto Protocols. So you're obviously not going to solve the problem there. This brings me back to uh, something that I uh, talk about a lot. The renewables are a critically important part of this mix. Uh, there's very little wind today, beautiful sunny day. Uh, uh, renewables are, tend to be geographically focused. Uh, it's quite, uh, sun is a great resource in the southwest, uh, California, southern, uh, the Texas west. Wind is a good resource in the Midwest. Wind is not a very good resource in the Mid-Atlantic region in the southeast. We have a wind farm in the West Virginia mountains. Uh, three years ago, we had 11 days. Those of you who were in Washington may remember this summer. There were 11 days over 100 degrees. We have 100 and, we have, uh, 182 megawatts uh, in that facility. And during those 11 days, on average, it produced one megawatt. And that's not because the, it, was, it was broken. Uh, it wasn't because the wind farm, uh, the, the transmission lines were down. It's because those of you who live in the Washington area know that when it gets really hot and humid in Washington, something's missing from the equation, right? The wind, there's no wind. It's very still and we all get quite hot. So uh, my own view is if you want carbon-free uh, emissions, that's a critical important, a critically important component is nuclear. Uh, all of our nuclear plants will be retired in this country by 2040 to 2050. They're providing enough uh, uh, megawatts now for uh, 25 million or more homes. We have got to deal with the nuclear issue, not just uh, replacing these one, the ones we have, uh, building new ones. So I look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists. Okay. Um, you want to go last? Yeah. All right, Daryl. Daryl, go. That's fair enough. Well, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you, Eileen uh, and C2ES, for inviting us to participate uh, today at the release of, of, of really a very good report. Um, just like to make a few comments. Um, I think the, the, um, the report adequately charts out the fact that, you know, the use of natural gas as it's expanding has had certainly and does have some really important um, benefits for us, certainly in the mid and short term with regard to reducing carbon emissions. As the report had charted out, our emissions are, are lower now, large part, uh, due to the, the fuel shift to, to natural gas. Um, but I think um, additionally there are certainly some things that I think we need to take into consideration during this period of expansion. And I know the report doesn't sort of highlight it, it's looking more at, at the end use, but in particular with regard to uh, gas use, we really think that it's very important as we move through this period of expansion, largely driven by new technologies in, in drilling and hydrofracking in particular, that we do this in an environmentally sustainable way. And one of the ways to look at that, we think, is to look very strongly and uh, I think move very forcefully toward um, you know, a set of really national minimum standards, environmental standards that protect you know, air, water, drinking water. And I think as the report highlighted with regard to methane, I think we seriously look at how we put in a set of procedures to make sure that we can control methane at, at a level that's going to be appropriate. And I think that, that requires looking, uh, as was highlighted earlier, at the complete value chain. Uh, so that we get an idea of where we can sort of do this in the most cost-effective and environmentally sound way. Um, and studies are now coming out now, I think, to so give us the data to do that a lot more intelligently along those lines. I think, secondly, the second point I'd, I'd like to make is that, you know, we've got this, we've got this very interesting, I think, opportunity right now uh, as, as, as we're looking at a fuel that is substantially cleaner from the standpoint of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental issues. Um, a range of efficiencies, I think, as a report had highlighted with regard to other sectors, is to intelligently use this time, time frame so that as we move in the longer term toward the, the middle part of the decade, the 2040s or 2050s, that we have a fuel mix that's going to allow us to hit the climate targets. 
uh, I think as Tom had pointed out, you know, if you, you model and, and bank out all of the replacement by coal with gas, we, we come up with a deficit here. So we've got an opportunity now to think clearly about putting into place, I think, a set of policies, incentives perhaps, that can give renewable sort of a complementary and a much more balanced playing field here that allows us to not only have the energy and fuel mixes that we are going to need to have a developing and an improving economy, but also to meet, meet our climate targets. And I think lastly, uh, I'd just like to, 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 to sum, sum up by saying it, um, where we are right now, to me, there are, there are three main sort of drivers. One is to move quickly to a much uh, lower carbon fuel, moving out uh, dirtier fuels like coal. Um, part of that's going to be how do we look at, for example, setting a price on carbon. I, I think that's going to be very critical in terms of allowing us to have this gas, energy efficient, renewable sort of mix. And I think thirdly is to, to use the opportunity to aggressively deploy and develop um, you know, technologies that are going to help us from the renewable standpoint, that's going to increase our energy efficiency use. And frankly, that might also help us to extend the lifetime of the bridge by looking at you know, carbon capture technologies along those lines. So I think those are some considerations I think that we, we should be looking at. I think it, uh, the report sort of highlights on them, but there are certainly things that I think will complement us moving ahead. Okay, Dave. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, thank you for hosting this and for the, the, the great work and C2S and Dr. Weber, thanks. Uh, as, a, a, as an Okie and a Sooner, I, it's one of the best reports I ever heard from a Texan, so I was just really... <laughs> Um, you know, well, no, well, wait a minute. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> very well done. And, and I have to be, as kind of the political pragmatist uh, in this town where there are very few left, I think, but I'm in violent agreement with both uh, my colleagues here. Uh, and that is, uh, I think Tom's right, we do need diversity in, in the fuel mix. And that's uh, something that's a foundation, I think, for uh, future energy. And I think what Daryl's saying is that we do want to move to a lower carbon future. And American innovation, American technology has provided that opportunity and that space to make this happen. And whether you call it a bridge, as we all know, it's a very, very long bridge uh, with the amount of resources that we have and the fact that we're going to have stable uh, prices. We now have an opportunity that other nations around the world don't have, and that's to have a lower cost energy strategy that would enable us to move to a lower carbon future. And there are a couple points in the in the uh, report that I wanted to highlight. And you know, transportation is great. We see that from a security standpoint, reducing our dependence on foreign oil, which is something, as a nation, we struggled with for over four decades. Uh, going back to Winston Churchill when they were trying to convert the Navy fleets to to oil, and so how we've gotten entangled uh, around the world, and the inability to address that. We now have an opportunity to to make major uh, contributions there. It's a domestic fuel, which certainly is a, a bonus for us. And it's abundant, it's affordable, and it's very clean. So that, that really does change the equation. And uh, just a few years ago, we were talking about peak oil and peak gas and era of scarcity. We're now talking about what are the challenges of an era of abundance and what does that do from an economic standpoint. And we have real economic advantages today that other nations don't. So it's a good news story, and it's a good news panel to have to, to kind of wrestle with these. You have to make it work you know, from a financial standpoint, but I think we have a foundation. Uh, a couple quick points, and, and I'm pleased that the report <coughs> focused on those. One is in the areas of buildings. And uh, you know, as we look at one of the largest, and as we try to increase our energy productivity, which is efficiency, which is one of the three pillars that we must have as a country, increased energy productivity, I think renewables have uh, been a long proponent of that, and natural gas, that we need to use it wisely. <clears throat> and in buildings with direct use, efficient appliances, we see uh, major opportunities to reduce our consumption in this country and our efficiency in doing so. But we need better labeling of appliances. We need the full fuel cycle analysis. We need those things that enable consumers to make rational choices uh, because there are investments up front that over the long term save money but also uh, improve uh, the, the economy and the environment. Uh, so we, we want to look at policies that enable that to happen. And I think there's some opportunities uh, 
on Capitol Hill. Very few opportunities on Capitol Hill to actually get bipartisan consensus, but I think we're moving there to get some agreement in some areas that would help advance that. Uh, one little factoid on that, if you converted, and we talked about fuel oil, and I don't think you're up in the far northeast there, Tom, but so much of the northeast is dependent on fuel oil, which is prices running at four bucks or close to the price of gasoline, compared to below two dollars or whatever the price uh, equivalent. Uh, that, and you see in cities like New York, Mayor Bloomberg, where they're actually mandating the conversion from fuel oil to uh, natural gas. If you switch that, we've talked about coal, but if you just switch the, coal, the fuel oil, it's the equivalent of taking 11 million cars off the highways. So it's a major opportunity that, uh, one, benefits consumer, but two, uh, has tremendous environmental benefits as, as well. The other is on the direct use uh, in uh, d distributed generation, too. Uh, CHP is what we call uh, the, the, the boxes that were shown up there. As you deal with issues of resiliency uh, in the Northeast and the coast areas, uh, post-Superstorm Sandy, all those kinds of issues, uh, governors, mayors, uh, communities, uh, businesses are, are really coming and asking this industry to find ways to make that more viable. And it has not only those security aspects, but it also has uh, tremendous environmental benefits. And again, re because of the efficiency of direct use of gas, you deliver 92% of the energy to the source or to the consumption, as opposed to a loss of about 32% in the grid. So there are real good uh, economic and environmental reasons to do that. So I just wanted to highlight those two. And uh, again, thank uh, the center, and uh, we look forward to questions from our wonderful moderator. Oh, okay. Um, so you all seem to agree that we need a diverse portfolio and that we have to make sure that we have renewables in the mix. Um, and I'd like to, and actually this could be for anybody here or all of you, how do we actually make sure that that happens? Well, there's an elephant in the room, and it's not political pun, I apologize. Uh, but, but the, 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 in the room, there is this question of what about the new economic paradigm of the low cost of affordable, abundant natural gas? And does that destroy the paradigm for developing renewables from a price uh, and economic standpoint? I don't believe that's the case. Uh, and the reason I think there's going to be policy, I think there's broad support for renewables at the state level. Uh, and a lot of this is, is as Tom mentioned, regional in you know, economic choices and rational energy choices. Uh, and uh, the national policy may not be as quite as aligned going forward yet, but I think there's strong support for having renewables, wind and solar. Uh, in my home state, and to be totally candid, in 1984 I was a legislator of the year in the wind and solar industry. So I, you know, I, I believe uh, what I say, but wind and solar is a little bit more abundant in Oklahoma. Uh, than in some places. But you have to work on the grid. You have to work on those things. Uh, and I think that the, the price of solar and wind is coming down. I think there's a, a point there. You know, how long those incentives, you know, that's going to be a, a, both a national and a local choice. We deal with the local utilities uh, commissions, uh, and they have to make those choices every single day. And I think they look at diversity, and I think they, as policy, as concerned Americans, want to have a, a stable and clean environment. And I think that momentum is there, and I think that momentum will continue. Well, a couple of points. I, I uh, uh, to follow up on what Dave said, I think um, certainly at, at the state level, one of the things that, that we've been advocating for a while is <clears throat> um, certainly a continued emphasis on things like renewable portfolio standards that can you know, certainly enable that, that balance to occur and, and in, in, a, in many ways sort of ensure that renewable sort of will get a, a good shot and uh, provide a market for, for renewable resources. I think at, there, there are other things too, I think at the federal level, um, national level, looking at, at, at a range of um, uh, fiscal incentives such as uh, renewable, uh, the um, uh, innovation tax credit and the, the PTC, for example. Uh, can really help again to sort of give that sort of level playing field to allow you know uh, renewable technologies to you know to be a complement to to gas as we move forward. I think the 
may be the most useful thing would be to uh, people have a really honest debate about it uh, instead of uh, the way the debate from my observations has gone on for years and years. Uh, there's a, there's a, assertions are made that renewables can solve all of the problems. They can provide Tomorrow. Tomorrow. all of yeah. our energy yeah. needs. Right. This, it's just these troglodytes in the utility industry who are, <laughs> who are stopping this from happening. And if you could just let uh, renewables deal with the situation, then we could take care of all the problems. It would be very inexpensive can happen almost overnight, uh, and uh, we just have to get our minds around that. Okay, that is an argument that's made. I think you've heard it. Not that you've made it, you, but I've, you've heard it. Uh, Thank that's, you. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> that is a ridiculous argument. It is, it is a fantasy world. Uh, renewables cannot solve all of the energy needs of the United States. We did an analysis in Virginia where our utility is, our electric utility is large, large part of Virginia. For us to uh, put in enough wind uh, to uh, solve Virginia's uh, existing, okay, not any growth, today's, today's loads, we would have to take up over a third of every square foot of the state of Virginia. Now that includes all the swamps and the highways and where your house is and up in the mountain ranges and all the slopes of the mountains and in the middle of the riverbeds. Okay, so that's just to deal with, you can't, it's never going to happen. And it doesn't help the debate, in my opinion, for people to assert that, you know, we can solve all of our problems with renewables. Renewables are an important component. They should, they should be, they should be a growing component. Solar is very useful. Solar rooftops are, are is, is developing very quickly and it's gonna be quite useful for distributed generation. But until, and if we could ever solve the storage, how do you store electricity on a, on a large scale, on a concentrated scale? Renewables could. I would then concede the argument, and renewables could. Uh, you'd have a beautiful day like this, and you could store enough electricity to run your house uh, tonight. Uh, today, you can't. Just fact. And it would, uh, I don't think it helps the, the debate to advance these arguments that it can solve all the problems. We need all of these things. As President Obama says, you need all of the different components uh, until there's a technology breakthrough. I would just comment on the Northeast briefly. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, getting fuel oil and diversity there. It's very important. Part of the problem in New, New England, we do have, uh, we have uh, gas fire power stations in Rhode Island and uh, the largest nuclear facility in, in New England, which is in, our, ours is in Connecticut. Um, is there's nowhere near, in, in, distributed generation be use, would be very useful, these fleets would be very useful. There's nowhere near enough infrastructure. Okay, you can't ignore the, sim, you, there's the highways get it there, but there's no pipelines. Yeah. There's no sto gas storage facilities in New England, anywhere, uh, except for an LNG import facility in the center of Boston Harbor, mm -hmm. which I don't think is gonna get expanded, I don't know, just, <laughs> just guessing. Uh, but it's, uh, there's not an, you, so there will have to be a yep. great deal more uh, expansion of infrastructure to make that work. Well, and one of the things in the report too was talking about expansion the opportunities here, and there is an infrastructure. We have 2.4 million miles of natural gas pipeline in this country, which, any other nation in the world is, is envious of and when we cite that. But it needs to always be upgraded and replaced and expanded because we get calls from governors every day saying, please, can you provide natural gas to this uh, you know, paper mill or this new manufacturing facility it's wanting to, to locate in the Northeast? And there are local challenges. And there's also a lot of granite that you have to deal with up there. And so, but there are new transmission uh, sources. But it's going to take that, uh, that combination. And those are interesting. There, there's a, a, a role for FERC in this. There's also a role for the local utility commissions and the states. And they're looking at innovative approaches. And the only thing from 30 plus years of dealing with Washington, D.C., uh, this is an amazing period that we live in because this is a transitional period, and yet we been given kind of a second chance as opposed to just having it as a crisis. We now have an opportunity to, to maybe be more strategic. And the biggest challenge as a country we have is that we don't think strategically any longer. We're all short-term and tactical. That's why studies like this and data, data, data is so critical for us to be able to align the challenges and then try to find 
reasonable solution. I mean, that, that's sort of my point, is that, you know, we've, 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 we've been given this opportunity here where we can realize in the short to medium term some significant reductions in, in greenhouse gases. It gives us this sort of opportunity, I think, to, to think intelligently about, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the arrows in the quiver. That it's not going to be just one magic bullet. It's going to be several that we'll need to develop to use appropriately, perhaps regionally, appropriately in terms of, you know, the circumstances. But we we should be using this time not only to, to to push those things, but I think, as you've mentioned, to have the opportunity to begin to have the courage to think strategically with data to look. Some of these things we talk about as technological challenges, it's not quantum mechanics. I mean, it's stuff we know how to do. You hear people say, well, Jesus, methane. Well, we know how to, you guys have captured methane sure, for years. Sure. It's a product, you use it. So how do we sort of think about, you know, applying our, our assets, our intellectual assets, to, to give us this leg up on new storage capacities, for example, so that renewables can sort of compete? Um, it, it may not be really flashy science, but I tell you, it's that type of baseline sort of innovation that we should be looking at this time frame to think strategically and develop. So, I mean, that sort of raises at least a couple of questions uh, from my perspective. I mean, the, f the first has to do, and Dave, you sort of answered this, how do you get the infrastructure built? Um, because I think there's no question that that would uh, result in reduced greenhouse gases and a better system. The, the second thing it, it raises is, if we're going to think strategically about the long term, which we all probably agree we should do, um, what do you do with what you've built long term? If you have a diverse portfolio and you have gas and coal, um, the only way to deal with the climate <laughs> is to find some way of capturing and sequestering it. I mean, um, how do you actually get there without a policy or a price or something like that? And, that, and that's an enormous well, challenge, at least in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't policy that got us to where we are today. You know, if anything, we've had to overcome policy to be in this position <laughs> we're in today, which is a good news story. Yeah. Because policymaking has ground to a halt because of the tone of debate and the, the, the kind of polarization that, that's occurred. What I, where I think we can go long term. First of all, it, you, anytime you have policy that's not connected with economic reality, it's hard. If they're not aligned, it's not going to succeed in the long term. Right now, we have an opportunity to align them better. Uh, and to do that, and, and I saw that when I was in the auto industry, where everybody said, well, those on one side said, we're just going to convert everything to electric vehicles. Well, it takes a long time, and it takes the consumer accepting that. The consumer has to be brought into this, quote, citizens have to be better informed about what their choices are what the real externalities and costs associated are. And also, even though we talk about energy security from a, we're not going to be energy independent. I don't think that's right because we're a trading nation and all the rest. But we don't do that in absence of the rest of the world. And if India and China and others aren't making similar progress and steps, then we are not going to succeed. Isn't it ironic that in Germany today that's put all this investment all this investment are now importing coal. coal from yeah, us. Exactly. Yes. You know, I mean, huge amounts of coal. So, you know, that's having an economics background. I always have to, you know, we have to be careful about how we say, well, the, we're going to have a policy and we adopt it. And it's going to change. Everything's going to be hunky dory. It, it doesn't work that way. So, so let's assume for a minute a, a no policy world, which is sort of the world we're in. Kind of the <laughs> world we're in. Um, yeah, in that way for a few, yeah, yeah. maybe a hundred years um, or so. How, <laughs> What's your vision of how you actually get there? Because, I mean, we've been working with companies for a long time because a lot of the innovation is there, a lot of the long-term thinking is there, and because they are so far ahead of the politicians. Um, so what is it that we can really do here? Well, I, I, I personally know that, Daryl, but again, I've been in the natural gas sector two and a half years now, but uh, in the happiest two and a half years, I think, of my life. But the, I, I ran the auto alliance for four years and dealt with the fuel economy standards and actually took a lead in, in trying to convene these kinds of discussions about what's in the long-term best interest of the industry, but at the same time, how can we impact 
uh, positively the environment and bring consumers along at the same time and then not have 30 different state policies going all over the place. And so we actually did come together on some consensus agreements. And it's actually, we reduced, uh, increased fuel economy by 40%, reduced greenhouse gases by 30%. But in all those discussions that we had, you started with a position in California that by 2050 you had to have zero emissions, period. Well, I'm not sure exactly how you got to that calculation. So the number, I didn't place as much emphasis on the absolute numbers because, you know, we know who creates absolute numbers, but the, it was the goal. So as long as we have similar goals, if we, if we can get the left and the right and the energy sector and everyone else to say, what are the goals? You know, one of the things that I learned coming into the energy sector, it was hard for some people to say that we actually ought to go to a lower carbon future, lower carbon economy. There were some who just flat don't believe that. I believe it sincerely. Uh, I also believe climate change is real. I've been to both poles. I've, and I'm married to a psychiatrist, and it's not because I'm bipolar. I mean, yeah, I've been, yeah, there's... You've actually been to both poles. Been to both. I've been to the South Pole and within 400 miles of the North Pole. I believe that this is occurring. So if we can start with these goals that it is in our economic interest, our political interest, security interest, certainly our security interest, having mm -hmm. been in armed services and intelligence, uh, and it's an environmental interest. The prudent policy, prudent policy would be Let's have diversity. Let's not put all our eggs in one basket. And let's keep funding that technology. Yeah. Technology and innovation, if there's money there, to, and the market's driving this. The one thing we haven't talked about a lot, the market is really working for, the, for what, you know, rationally it's working right now. Well, I think just, just to, to, um, you know, to add to that, I think one of the things that certainly helps, we talked about uniform standards that, that are... Um, I'm a believer that, that if you look at regulatory regimes that have some certainty to them, that do not change over time, that, um, that might be strict uh, and probably should be strict, but they give a target and a goal for us to apply our, you know, our innovation and technology to, we can, do, we can do wonders. It's when these things aren't certain, when there is a patchwork, when firms can't sort of plan to know what the future may look like, um, is sort of where we are now. And I think that sort of set of certainties begins to set, I think, a, you know, a baseline in terms of planning, in terms of, you know, pushing, you know, your 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 innovation, uh, your people to, to hit that intersection set between what's going to be good business and good products, as well as, you know, um, good for you know the environment and what have you. I think very important. I, I agree with you. We think of, from our perspective. I, I live on the and work on the other side of the Beltway, so uh, <laughs> yeah, and okay. the big. I, I know. Although my son lives inside the Beltway, he's work, working on it. But the uh, uh, when we plant a power station, uh, we're, we're building a power station just uh, actually in Warren County, which in the northern Virginia suburbs or outer way outer suburbs. Uh, and we're looking at building another one in the very south, southern part of Virginia. When we are building those plants, we're planting that plant. It's supposed to. It's going to operate for 60 years. Uh, it's going to cost over a billion dollars uh, to build it, uh, and then we're going to run it for 60 years. That's a that's a fairly long-term investment. Uh, uh, we're looking at building a new nuclear station uh, in the central part of Virginia. Uh, that will be that facility will run at least 60 years and will cost many, many billions of dollars to build. Uh, so when we, we have to, the, the uh, reliability of the regulation uh, is critical for us. Uh, we went recently through our industry, went through a long discussion about the, what so people call the Mercury Rule, the, the MACT Rule that recently came out of EPA. Um, and it's, it's uh, got it much stricter, depends on what, how, what your perspective is, uh, more appropriate limit, whatever your perspective is, there's a change in the limits of uh, various levels of emissions. Uh, and getting it set uh, tells, allows us to plan that 60 years. Now, if it's going to be changed in three years, that's a problem. You know, that's a big problem for us uh, when we're, we're making those kind of investments. So we need... Uh, pretty straightforward certainty. I, one thing, uh, we p talked about carbon capture and storage several times. They say it's not rocket science. We've done, it's been done for 
decades uh, in the in the uh, in the EMP in the right. uh, uh, production business. Production. They put uh, carbon carbon down into the wells. It, it <coughs> agitates the wells and, and allows the petroleum the the uh, oil to flow, and it stays there. Uh, this is a completely different level, though. Uh, we're talking about taking very large amounts of carbon emission, carbon dioxide. Uh, it is what it's what they call a vampire technology. Some people call it a vampire technology because when you put it on the power plant, it takes a huge amount of the energy from the power plant to capture the carbon. So you can reduce the uh, efficiency of the power plant by as much as 40 percent. I've seen, and you know, hopefully the technology would get better and better. Wouldn't do that. So you think about what you're doing. Just think about what you're doing. You're extracting something out of the ground, coal or gas. You're putting it into a, a plant. You're, you're uh, igniting it. Uh, it's creating this emission. The emission then you're capturing, and you're using a whole bunch of the power you've, you've created to capture it. And then you're uh, going to change its form a little bit so it's easier to transport. You're going to transport it over some distance, probably a long distance. And then you're going to put it back where you found it, basically, mm. under the ground. It's got to stay there for a long time. That's a, and it's very large amounts. Yeah. So uh, it's not, a, people say it, a carbon capture story. It's actually quite complicated. It's going to be very expensive. Uh, and I would put the dollars in to find some young geniuses uh, sitting in a garage probably someplace uh, to take the mole, crack the molecules yeah. mm -hmm. and put them into their component parts. I don't understand right. why that's yep. so darn hard yeah. myself, uh, but apparently it is. <laughs> But I got an economics well, yeah. and law degree. Is my or, organic yeah. chemistry is why I went to law school instead of med school with my wife. So I don't understand why a, that's so hard. I mean, it's just water vapor. Yeah, that's right. Well, there is an amazing yeah. amount of research going on. And, you know, again, but, you know, our D Department of Energy puts very little uh, research and development into the natural gas sector. And now I think that's going to have to change. And we see some on storage and tanks and those mm -hmm. things. And But those are small can compared to other investments, but they do pay off and we need to work on them. Well, I was just going to add um, that um, I, th I think you're right. I think one of the, the real challenges with, with the, the carbon capture technology is getting a sense of whether to ask some really tough but needed questions on you know, the economic train and the energy life cycle train of this process, which to date, you know, we just haven't been able to do. We've seen it small scale. There have been these attempts to do something at large, real scale. It gets back to getting real data that we can make. Right. Uh, you know, you run something at scale, the, 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 the appropriate, um, you know, engineering data should enable us to make really good decisions on just what you mentioned, Tom. So, and we have not been able to sort of have that set of debate. We've seen things at small scales yeah. and maybe on sort of something a little larger than a bench top. Uh, I'm certainly skewing that dis that description, but certainly not at at operating conditions in the real world. Yeah, the, the only cautionary point, and again, the experience of being in this city for quite some time, I recall that there was consensus during the Carter administration, or you know, the the fears and moves and some of the policies, and we created Senfields Corporation, and we tried big big projects that mm -hmm. did not yes, work, did not. and put us down on some, <coughs> some alleys. And so we have to be, here we do have an opportunity that other nations are not as fortunate to have, and that is uh, we have a market that's actually working, we have a lower cost fuel. But then, again, we need to be shifting more to this strategic and find those, that, that, that those common objectives. Yeah, okay, well, I'd like to open it up for questions from all of you. Yes, okay. now I think there's I think we have a microphone he won't available. Need a microphone. <laughs> and, and, it, and it would be great if you would just say who you are and then ask away. Okay, yeah, I was in the field artillery, so I think they'll hear yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, wait a minute. Here we go. Here we go. It's a question for, I'm Bronco Terzig with Deloitte. It's a question for Tom. The difficulty in citing linear systems, transmission lines, and, and pipelines, uh, your company has some really unique experience and that negative experience with the with the time. Has that improved? Have the regulators, both state and federal, improved the cycle of how quickly they can review something and, and so that you can build uh, infrastructure in a timely manner? I actually think that for the pipeline uh, siting system works quite well. 
uh, I think. Um, FERC has uh, developed a pre-filing process uh, because once you file, you've got all these rules, and that's fine. The rules are the rules. Uh, but once you file the application, you can't talk to anybody inside the building. Uh, you know, it's all done through litigation style. It's not really litigation, but a procedural. So you file in papers. Everybody files papers and all that. Uh, they have a pre-filing process where you can sit down with the staff and really work through <coughs> issues and just so you know what, what to try to deal with uh, in advance of the filing. Uh, and then once you make the filing, if you've done it appropriately, uh, things move along more quickly. Just for example, this Cove Point uh, LNG facility, uh, we already have all the tanks, we have the pipes, we have the terminal. All we're trying to build is a liquefier, but we, we need two permits. We need an export permit from DOE. But we also need an environmental permit because of the uh, enhancements to uh, CoPoint. We filed a 12,000-page application uh, for a site that's already there and has everything already in it, uh, except for this just this liquefier. But that should only probably take nine months to do. Pipelines are easier because they're underground. People don't get as <coughs> upset about them. Electric transmission lines, on the other hand, uh, I find them very attractive myself. <laughs> uh, but apparently not, every, apparently not everybody does. And uh, we, they're, uh, they're necessary. Uh, we do not sit around in our offices and say, who can we aggravate today? Who would we really like to aggravate today? How about the horse country outside of Washington, D.C.? <laughs> or how about uh, uh, Colonial Williamsburg? Uh, because we're, there is a, a line we're trying to put across the James River uh, that's, but here's the choice. We can put that line across the James River. It's nine miles total. Costs about $50 million. We can put it under the river, which is un, unproven technology because it's 500,000 volts. Uh, and that will cost almost 10 times as much. So, you know, utilities, we make money by spending money. Uh, so, you know, we, we don't, that's not our first choice, but if that's what happens, but it, that's the debate. It's very difficult for regulators. That's a difficult debate for them, and I don't envy them, you know, but because their mission is for us, our mission is to deliver uh, reliable electricity at, at a reasonable cost. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hi, I'm Tamar Hallerman. I'm a reporter for a trade publication called GHG Monitor. And I want to plug back into the discussion you're having about CCS and the potential that you see particularly for CCS on gas. Obviously, in the last couple of years, uh, most of the emphasis has been on coal, but people are starting to, to uh, mull the idea of CCS on gas. A, a lot of groups are talking about how uh, it's a good medium-term opportunity if you want to extend the lifetime of gas, if you want to stay under the UN's target of, of two degrees. And you can see the Obama administration start to kick around the idea. They proposed a $25 million inducement prize for CCS on gas. I'm curious what, what you three see as the potential for that. Is that something we should be putting our money into, or are renewables kind of the, the way to go? I just talked. Go yeah. <laughs> uh, well. I'll go next. Yeah. It's um, car carbon capture for natural gas. Uh, can make sense and probably does. It, it's the methane. First of all, you got CO2 and then you have methane. Uh, methane is the, the more immediate concern and that was the numbers that I think Tom even mentioned with the EPA's inventory, recent inventory, which showed is about one half percent from the production. So, but we are doing more monitoring. We're actually working, uh, groups are and, and companies with Environmental Defense Fund and others to, find, to actually monitor and understand where the emissions are uh, and what the primary source is. So it's in our economic interest, quite frankly, to reduce those emissions. Uh, and distribution is considered to be point, I don't know, 05 or something. My technical people would tell me. Uh, but it's a, it's a relatively small amount. Uh, so then the question becomes at the other end of that where the combustion occurs, and that would be in the power uh, generation sector. Uh, transportation sector, uh, having been in that sector some, I think they want to capture that as well, not only from their own uh, greenhouse gas requirements as, as uh, fleets, but also because it's a, a source, an energy source. So. 
you see more efficient engines, and you know it's interesting in the fuel economy world. Everybody said, "Oh, we got to go to electric vehicles to get these numbers down." My goodness, they're still getting more efficiency out of the internal combustion engine, and you see the numbers coming down. But you have Westport and others that are developing these new natural gas-specific engines for big fleets, you know, a class eight type trucks, and they're going to capture that as well. So. I, I don't see just one big, you know, everybody thinks about these huge mega cross-border kinds of projects. I think good investments, you know, $25 million is probably a drop in the bucket. I don't know what's your annual investment rate, but... Uh, $4 billion. $4 billion, you know. Uh, it's, it's really targeting where those are and then saying, and, and seeding a number of them. And I think universities, uh, you know, are working aggressively. And, and I've been to a number of universities in Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Texas and Oklahoma where they're really, MIT and others, Ernie Moniz, the new Secretary of Energy, I think probably has as maybe one of his goals uh, trying to address this issue because he understands natural gas, he understands uh, some of these long-term targets, and he thinks strategically. I think it's a superb choice for this kind of uh, discussion right now. And um, so I'm, I'm, you know, whether it's technically feasible in the next five years, you know, again, we're looking 30, 20, 30 year kind of cycles here, and that's probably a goal we ought to be thinking about. Yeah, just to comment on what you mentioned with regard to sea, uh, carbon capture and sequestration and, and gas. Yes, I think, um, you know, I'm not sure whether, you know, $25 million <laughs> for this type of problem yeah. might be enough of an inducement. Um, to be frank about it, it's a lot of money, but, but on the same side, of, on the other side of that coin, um, it, it's a very expensive sort of, and, and large scale sort of effort. I mean, Tom had articulated certainly some of the sort of issues with, if, you, if you move to full scale. Um, you know, I come from the standpoint that, yeah, it's worth potentially looking at it, partic particularly to generate you know, some real data in terms of its real feasibility to sort of make sure we know whether it is indeed feasible economically and practically. And I think in doing something at scale, perhaps in partnership, you know, this is an excellent opportunity for a public-private partnership to sort of yeah. look at a full-scale plant, um, look at where there are technological barriers, if there are any, but understand how it operates. So, yeah, I mean, the, that prize is, is a nice... Um, perhaps starter, but there may be other sort of incentives. So I do think it might not necessarily be a starker choice of saying either this or renewables. You know, I think we've got enough room in the, you know, on the, on the, uh, on the table here to sort of look at both of them. Because I think if it yeah. indeed can be shown... As an American, I would tell you, I, I am distressed that other countries uh, are using energy in far less efficient ways or making strides in investments, China and others, that pale, uh, that we pale in comparison of. And I think we as a country need to renew our uh, energy portfolio and, and look at the research dollars. And again, I don't see this, and get away from the, the, the BS of charges of, you know, this investment versus that, because, you know, government research dollars, in my view, having been on the science committee, is that it can afford to fail. You know, it, it's and it's, it's designed. It's designed. designed. It fails yeah. The of the time. And it's not, uh, you know, you don't want to have stupid things and, you know, corrupt things, but you, but you really need this investment. And that's what government does because by the time it gets to the commercial side or, the, you know, it's, it's a much more mature technology, this is where the innovation actually occurs. And we need to spawn more innovation. And it's not just in one area. It's not just in renewables. We're going to have fossil fuels for a long time long time in this world. And we haven't even talked about methane hydrates and those kinds of things right. the Japanese are looking yeah. at exactly. and others. Yeah. Exactly. So that's where... And globally. It's and globally. Yeah. Huge, huge, yeah. huge opportunities. Okay, if we describe things as huge opportunities, then I think money actually does flow. So, uh, but we need to be... This is where government can actually be leveraging strategically and wisely if... if and we, that's why this conversation is important. Mm -hmm. We need to broaden this conversation. Uh, we need more environmentalists in, in, in this discussion. We need more of industry. Uh, and we need policymakers to, to actually hear this and, again, start grounding it in data. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 
Thank you. I'm Margaret Ryan. I'm with Interfax Natural Gas Report. And I wondered, you made some mention earlier of the fact that renewables, I believe you, Mr. Banks, said they, you know, they needed the continued uh, production tax credit and other tax help from the federal government. If this is to, in the end, be market driven, I'm wondering, you know, how how important do you see as those tax credits? Would without them, without state renewable portfolio standards, in other words, without government intervention, would anything besides natural gas plants be being built now? Uh, and and how do you see that? Or are they? I guess I'm asking, are they in the right configuration right now, or is there a better way to cast? the various state and federal renewables requirements to make it fit in better with the long-term strategy and make them viable in the long term? Uh, I'll tell you from my perspective, I'm not in the policy making uh, business like my colleagues here are. I'm, in the pol I'm on the other end of the policy. I could let live with the policies. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, but um, uh, you got to be careful with. I really think it's you get the government when the government gets involved in the incentive incentivization of things through economic incentives. Uh, it can lead to all sorts of unintended consequences, um, and uh, overall government policies can lead to all sorts of unintended consequences. Uh, you mentioned the Carter administration earlier. I don't. I'm not trying to pick on the Carter administration. Just these things. Some of these things happened during the Carter administration. One was the. I don't even remember what it was called, the gas, the gas Act that made it illegal yeah. to burn natural gas in yeah. a power plant. Oh, yeah. It was illegal. Gas Use Act, I guess yeah, it was called. Yeah. Um, so what's that do? It created scarcity. It, uh, <laughs> and it, well, it made utilities say, so, well, okay, can't burn but gas. Uh, what else oh, do we have yeah. that's abundant? Yeah. Yeah. Coal. We have coal. Let's go bur build coal plants. So uh, there's a wave of coal plants built in the 1970s, okay? And all of a sudden, now people say, oh, coal? What, why in the world would you have built coal? What's it? Dirty. Well, because there were, there were policies put in place that people weren't thinking would drive people in that direction, but they just, these are very complicated issues. People sit out there after the policies, I mean, they think, okay, okay, that's the policy, I gotta live with the policy, now what do I do? And they end up in going in directions you never dream of them going. So, um, I know this is heresy in a lot of places, but I think actually if you let people make the economic choices, it will end up in the right place. It's going to take you longer than you may want, but it will, it will end up in the right place. But the simple answer is, I think if you ask a lot of the people who are deep into renewable power, or, and we, we've built it ourselves, but if you look at the economics of it, you just would never do it. You just would never do it. You, it it's much, unless, you'd have to have a national policy where uh, consumer, you mentioned yeah. public, if you want a lot more renewable power, you're going to have to back it up with natural gas fired power plants for when the wind d drops suddenly. You got to have a power plant that come on, can come on quickly to cover the load. So you got twice the sources of power. You just the, the public is going to have to recognize that power is going to be much more expensive, and that's why I just it's not useful in my opinion to have a debate that says renewables can solve all the problems and its cost costs nothing, because it, it's going to cost a lot more. Well, just to, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that I think that the um, um, again the, the the issue is not an all renewable world. It's it's uh, it's a world that will will have this diversity of, of fuel mixes. I think one of the key pieces, and I mentioned it earlier, in addition to um, you know looking at things like the production tax credit and those other incentives, uh, frankly, is looking at a price on carbon. And I think once we begin to deal with that issue, um, a number of things, you know, costs begin to be much more realistic. Uh, I think. Um, um, publics get an opportunity to really make wise decisions in terms of their energy choices. But until we get to that point where we really are looking at a price on carbon, which will move us to cleaner fuels, natural gas being one of them, renewables being part of that, um, you know, we're going to be in this sort of um, uncertain world where we're sort of, you know, fighting this incentive versus that incentive and not really 
providing, I think, the sort of economic sort of set of baselines that people can make really wise choices and firms can make wise choices on their energy mixes. Well, I hate to bring it, because we've been so optimistic today, I don't want to be totally pessimistic, but I would tell you there are a couple things that we have to be mindful of. Look at the fiscal environment uh, that we find ourselves in and, and as a country and as a nation. And so until they get their fiscal house in order, and maybe price on carbon is part of their solution, I don't know. but. You know they're they're dealing with that. So the tax credits with subsidies, outright subsidies, I think their days are limited, if not over. Uh, days of tax credits, and we've we've used the tax code as the default energy policy because we haven't had mm -hmm. energy policies, mm -hmm. so we use the tax code, and that's just riddled with all kinds of things. And then uh, that again, get too far out on a limb. Uh, don't get me started on biofuels and ethanol and those kinds of, of farm policies and interest groups directing, you know, regional outcomes. At the time, made sense because it was a snapshot. So we do all these snapshot policies, and then we live with the consequences for an awful long time. So right now, I think we have to be really careful about jumping to you know, absolute policies are saying, this is the solution, we're going all in here. Because you know, the prudent policymaker would say, let's use a little bit of what we've got, let's, uh, and then figure out where the, the, the most opportunity is, <clears throat> and let's not do it in the sense of crisis. Fortunately, we don't have the 73 oil crisis, or the oil embargo, and the Yom Kippur War, and we've gone through two really disastrous wars recently. and so. Maybe we're in a position that we can start taking a step back, get our fiscal house in order, look at some of these long-term policies, increase our research and development, and allow the market to work. And consumers, hopefully, we get this economy restarted, and natural gas is helping re-kick the economy, but based on your be report. Before I go to the next questions, I just have to say, yeah, we have a lot of stupid policies, and government is, like everybody else, flawed and does a lot of silly things, but you know we need them. We do. Okay. We need go. I just wanted to make make sure that point. Yes. <laughs> Which one, I lean? Oh, um, I'm gonna lean right. <laughs> diverse. Go diverse yeah. first. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'll try to be brief and perhaps we could squeeze in too. Uh, Jennifer Kiefer with the Alliance for Industrial Efficiency. And my question is to, uh, for you, Tom, and perhaps for you, Dave, as well. Um, Dave had pointed out the tremendous potential of combined heat and power. Um, and I know that AGA just released a report last week as well, um, confirming that there's in fact 40 gigawatts of CHP potential in the natural gas um, sector that uh, could have less than a 10 year payback. Um, my question for you, Tom, is I know you also highlighted, you know, with respect to more convention other conventional renewables, mm -hmm. that uh, storage is a real problem. Um, that problem doesn't exist for CHP. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering what utilities can do, perhaps absent some of the federal interventions you were just um, talking about, to help support uh, that tremendous deployment of CHP. Uh, these are, uh, can be very, it could solve a lot of issues uh, around, uh, it could help with uh, load requirements, like it gets really hot in the summertime. Uh, one of the things we're looking at, for example, is putting, uh, it's a little bit different, I mean, technology is different, solar panels on large rooftops uh, that will help us with our problems around usage and very high usage periods. It's going to be quite helpful, and we're doing that in various places in Northern Virginia. These technologies, we're putting in the, what will be the largest fuel cell array in the United States right now. We're installing uh, in Connecticut uh, under a long-term power purchase screen back to uh, a university in Connecticut. Uh, it's going to be, I think, 72 megawatts, which is the issue, part of the issue. Uh, because 72 megawatts, that's the largest in the, in the United States. Uh, a nuclear reactor, which the, just the reactor itself, there's lots of other things around the reactor. The reactor itself is about the size of this room. Uh, can produce uh, 1,500 megawatts. Okay, so that much larger scale. So, but but and the issue we'll have to deal with, and I think it is a big part of the future, uh, is is this distributed gen, uh, very big part of the future. Is you is the get you got to get the gas, 
uh, to, to the machine. So it's the AGA represents the distribution companies largely. So that's the smaller pipes that are running through the, these, these neighborhoods, wash and gas light business here. Um, we, our company has those in Ohio and West Virginia, but we also, you got to get the big interstate gas, but there's no gas produced in New England. So just use my, my example in Connecticut. We got to get gas to the facility. You're going to have to have, the gas got to be extracted. It's got to be gathered. It's got to be put in a big pipeline. It's got to be delivered to the distribution point and then delivered along the line. There's nowhere near enough inf gas pipeline infrastructure in New England today uh, to deal with what they have uh, existing. So uh, it's not as simple as saying we're going to put in the, the uh, combined heat and power facilities. It's great, and we will do that, and it's an important part of the future. But there's a whole lot that going on underground uh, to get the get the the fuel to it. Just just quickly, and, and we did release a report, and it was really I think very informative and great data in there. And and I agree with Tom. In 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 parts of the Northeast, and they've got a combination of things: the resilience issues and reliability, and some of those. Uh, but capacity is a challenge. And uh, but fortunately, and before we end this program, I wanted to get this point across: that is not a federal government investment. That's not taxpayer dollars that's going to make that happen. It's going to be transmission, and they are building more transmission because the demand is going to increase. So it's kind of this chicken and the egg a little bit we see in transportation, but we also see it there. Uh, because of the price of natural gas, which is at $4, it was down as low as 2 but I think it's going to be between 4 and 6 for a long time. All of a sudden, there is more demand in the Northeast for that natural gas and those big, those MLPs and others and big transmission <coughs> lines are going to be heading up that way. And so it's not just at the end of the pipeline and also coming down from Canada. So once that gas is there, and again, these are long-term multi-year investments, decadal investments, uh, I think you're going to see that balance. But fortunately, it's not going to require government action other than the regulators. So FERC on the transmission and uh, state regulators. In Connecticut, they're looking at legislation to incent expansion uh, mm -hmm. for, for new pipe. Uh, so the state legislature and the governor is very aggressive, uh, the, the governor of Connecticut, in trying to get natural gas there to displace fuel, oil, and other sources. Mm -hmm. So these are good news stories. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. I think you make a good point. Sorry, I'm, I'm from World Watch Institute. I think you make a good point that uh, the, the current incentives, you know, really don't encourage the kind of diversity that we'd like to see in the utility sector. So we're going, you know, quickly to a, you know, sort of a gas dominant system. Uh, there are a couple of proposals out there now that that I, that I think would realign uh, the incentives that I appreciate your your reaction to. Uh, one is to make uh, renewable energy project developers eligible for the master limited partnership uh, structures that, of course are being used uh, very successfully uh, to, to build natural gas pipelines. Uh, you know, right now, anyone who wants to build a, a gas pipeline can get, get uh, the, the financing at a much lower interest rate than anybody building a wind or solar project. So be interested in your reaction to that. And the second idea, which, which is really a very simple one, and I'm surprised it's not discussed more, would be to get rid of the fuel adjustment clause. I mean, utilities, you know, you know they're, they're there's not a problem with being totally dependent on gas because the customer will simply uh, pay the cost because it gets passed through. What what if the utility had to, had to bear that risk? Um, I think you would immediately see a move to, towards diversity. I'm sure you'd want some gas, uh, but you'd want to have things like wind and solar and you know perhaps even nuclear uh, that are not going to bear that risk. Well, I, I'll just comment uh, about fuel adjustment clauses. Most states have them, uh, and most states adopted them uh, in the 70s uh, because, when, because of the oil embargoes. Uh, many, there were, in those days, many of the boilers that are uh, used now were fired by oil. Uh, and if you, so if you have your rates included and bundled up, as they would call it, bundled into your rates, the fuel is bundled, uh, uh, you can, and it's a very volatile fuel mix. What can happen is you can you can challenge it very quickly the economic viability of the utility, and that's what was happening in the 70s. 
oil was skyrocketing, uh, there was a fixed price in their, in their rate structure for the fuel. And it was, you were uh, challenging whether a utility was actually going to be able to survive. Okay, now that says, well, as shareholders, it's public. Well, utilities are a little bit different than most companies is because the economic vitality of the state and the, and the communities depend on the utility uh, being healthy. And they've seen this uh, in, in places time after time. Fuel adjustment clauses. Uh, can, you're thinking about when they work to the disadvantage of the customer, but they can also work to the advantage of the customer. Uh, three years ago, four years ago, uh, natural gas was $14 a million cubic feet. If you'd bundled in the fuel at that price into the rate, they'd still be paying $14 uh, a million cubic feet instead of three. So it, you can't think about it just as a one-sided uh, down the street. MLPs are, uh, we don't use an MLP structure ourselves for our pipeline business uh, for a variety of reasons, but they are, they are uh, quite useful uh, in, in, that, in the infrastructure business. Uh, I think you, you could make good arguments for the uh, MLPs in that sector, if you, assuming you give up the other tax incentives. Uh, that could lead to a proliferation of these vehicles, and that may be a good thing, that may be a bad thing. It's, again, it's, you got to think through, well, what, what are the real long-term consequences? But uh, I think it would be quite useful to that, to that sector. And just to comment on MLPs, um, we, sit, we certainly agree that it, it, it's a really viable policy to look at. We've just done some, in this last several months, some very um, interesting re reports out of my shop um, suggesting to expand you know, the availability of MLPs for renewables. Yeah. Can I get We're going to do two more questions. One and two. <clears throat> My name is McKinley Addy, and I uh, directed a lot of the work in California that customized the U.S. DOE grid, grid model uh, for use in regulatory and program uh, and policy uh, activities. And um, also led a number of the medium and heavy duty natural gas programs uh, in California. My question uh, goes to David. There is uh, some questions about the life cycle GHG benefits for liquefied natural gas in the uh, trucking sector. And a lot of that is tied to the efficiency of engines. Although we hear a lot about uh, some of these new engines that are coming out uh, into the marketplace, uh, that question still uh, uh, exists. So what is AGA doing to support the technology and innovation to address some of the efficiency gaps um, for natural gas engines, because if we're going to capture the fuel cost saving benefits of uh, natural gas um, in the trucking sector, that efficiency uh, challenge has to be addressed. Well, I'm not an engine expert, but I sit on panels with them on a regular basis. And if you talk to the CEO of uh, Westport Cummings, uh, they will tell you that uh, their new 12 liter engine is probably the most efficient uh, large engine for a Class 8 truck. And this is where you see the largest fuel consumption uh, on the interstate highways. Uh, there's a, a number of companies that are converting, uh, you know, whether it's uh, waste management on the fleets, on garbage trucks, uh, long, you know, the, the, the big trucks. Some of those are, are compressed natural gas, some are LNG. Uh, the LNG uh, you know, there are a couple issues that they want to address, not just energy efficiency, it's the storage. Uh, the ARPA-E program on storage has potentially great uh, opportunity, and there's some that even companies or entities that are uh, doing research that are not even uh, using the grants uh, to, to be able to reconfigure tanks, make them uh, more efficient, and reduce the, the temperature challenges. Um, and if you can do that, and in trucks, weight's not as much of an issue. You may have to have some allowance. allowance. <coughs> a bigger issue for us is actually making sure that the natural gas equivalent uh, has the same taxing as diesel, because there's a disproportionate tax there, and, and we don't think that's a, a appropriate. Uh, you know, if you took those, however, eight million uh, trucks on the highway today and uh, reduced their uh, diesel component, uh, you'd cut half of our imports of uh, petroleum in this country. So it's uh, an incredible opportunity. But, uh, you know, the technologies companies are working into, universities are, are working into, 
uh, in addition to the efficiency, I think you're going to see more uh, capture emissions uh, technology applied, not only at the engine, but also in the fueling infrastructure. But this is, it's going to come. Uh, I saw a recent chart which showed the diesel, um, kind of an S-curve of adoption of diesel in the 70s, uh, post uh, the embargoes, is a rather steep curve. We're now starting to see that same kind of curve develop on LNG. Uh, and there's enough LNG for, for Tom and the rest of us to, to, to be able to use it. Yeah. Okay, last, last question over there. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, my name is Amy Roydenblum. I'm with the National Association of Clean Air Agencies. We're an association of state and local air pollution control agencies across the country. And first, I want to thank you, Eileen, for convening an absolutely fascinating discussion, as always. I always enjoy these and these reports. I want to pick up on something that Mr. Farrell said about um, the market being the place where those kinds of issues can be solved in terms of climate. I was an economics major in college, and it was a very long time ago. But I do believe in the market and powers of the market. But something we learned in studying economics is that the market isn't good in dealing with externalities. And I think carbon is a big externality here. With respect to air pollution control, I don't think you'd see the dramatic reductions in NOx and SOx and particulate matter and mercury if you didn't have the Clean Air Act requiring those kinds of reductions. Air pollution control technology would not have been on the market without regulatory requirements. So I think carbon's in the same place. So you need some sort of driver, whether it's an explicit price on carbon through a carbon tax or an implicit price through market interventions through the government like renewable power standards or a requirement to reduce CO2 emissions. So I wondered if there was something I was missing in the market forces that you see as driving us toward lower carbon economy, or if not, then what is, do you think is the right role for government in that? Thank you. No, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, I didn't, wouldn't want to be misunderstood on this. Uh, I think if you're going to, rather than saying we're going to try to, we're going to reduce carbon because we're going to mandate carbon capture and storage or we're going to reduce carbon because we're going to mandate this, or we're going to reduce carbon, we're going to mandate that. It's better to pick a market-based market solution. Uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, uh, sulfur dioxide reductions, NOx reductions. It's a perfect example, I think, of something that has worked extremely well, which it's a market-based, they put in, uh, put in the allowance system, uh, and utilities could choose between putting in the equipment or buying the allowances, and the allowances reduced over time. And that gave the market incentives to develop the technologies. Uh, and I think that's probably, is a, I have an economics degree as well. It's, pro I'm sure, much longer ago than yours. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, but it probably hasn't changed that much, uh, the economic theory. That it's better to put in a market-based policy that will drive the right solutions. I, I thank you for asking the question, because that's really, that's my view of it. That, the reductions in, in uh, acid rain and sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, has been driven by what I think were very intelligent, market-based uh, driven policies. God, one of my programs from my days. There you okay. go. Okay. Always back to you. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I think this has been a great panel. Um, and I want to thank everyone for being informed, which I sort of knew you were before we picked you to be on the panel, but for being so frank about your views and what some of the issues are, the opportunity side and the challenges side. So I'd like everyone to thank you. It's been terrific. Thank you. Thank you.